Mr. Shove told me when I was 25 and first met him. He said, Mr. Owen, in my personal opinion, financial independence is a worthy goal. <laughs> now, he really said that for a reason, because a lot of people are having problems with financial independence simply because they have some moral issues really confused in their minds about the value of money or the danger of money or having too much money or that the true values of life are not wrapped up in money so money really doesn't matter that much and uh, some people have some problems in this area and I'll admit I had some when I first started making more money in one month than my father made in one year I was at first I was very disturbed by that and guess what for a long time I wouldn't even tell my parents I didn't tell them I said what are they gonna think I make more money in one month than my father makes in one year how can I tell them and I was really confused about that I was really bothered by that for quite a while I think it was several months <laughs> no because here's when it ended I finally worked up the courage to tell them how I was doing I can't remember now just how I put it I was just trying to figure out some way to put it right to break the news to him so it you know wouldn't be you know too great a shock when I told them what I was doing and what was happening and what was going on they were just incredibly delighted they were terribly happy terribly excited and I discovered that I'd worried and been bothered all those months for nothing because I had this in my mind how am I going to justify it how am I going to you know work this whole thing out how are they going to feel and sure enough I had just conjured all the stuff up in my mind and it really was not real but some people really have some problems on financial independence because they feel that the morality of earning lots of money is is a very valid question every once in a while someone after my seminar says yeah, I think you talk too much about money success and that's not where the good life is the good life is not just money and success and making a lot of money and doing well financially and I understand that I really do and I have pondered those subjects all these years and I don't want it to make it seem like just going for money or financial success is where the true values are they are not and hopefully in my seminar I've got enough in there to try not to mislead people that I'm just thinking of financial success but um, so Mr. Shove said to me in my opinion financial independence is a worthwhile objective he said here's why he said Jim once you get money out of the way you can't believe the other dimensions of your life you can work on once you solve the money problem he said now you'll have the time more time to work on certain other projects of your life that will really start to grow and expand so he said for that reason I think financial independence is a worthwhile objective and I know part of it's a moral question there is a Bible phrase that says the love of money is the root of all evil but I'm sure the phrase is probably more correct in saying the love of money the love of money now when I did start getting some of those big big bonus checks way back in those early days my first crack at money right um, I wasn't too worried about you know whether or not it was going to ruin me <laughs> one of my friends right his wealthy friend when he started making a lot of big money said Robert I, I don't know if I should give you all this big money or not said you know money's ruined a lot of people and Robert said just try me one time I mean <laughs> let's just see so we're all willing to go through it I'm sure that first time but um, I know it is a moral question sometimes it's something you just have to wrestle with but here's what I found out financial independence is not something you have to throw away all of the values to acquire you don't have to throw them all away now you could and that would be foolish if there's a half a dozen major values and you threw away five to go for one see that it would be foolish but in my opinion you really don't have to but now in the moral question for those who press me a little bit about talking too much about money and finance and being successful I have another question in response sharpening up my debating skills and here's my question 
If you could do better, should you? That's pretty good. On my side of the debate, right? If you could do better, should you? Sometimes people use the moral question as an excuse to be lazy and not to improve. Then on the other side, part of it is just the challenge to see what you can become regardless of what the amount is. A man said to me one time, well, Mr. Owen, I'm making about $50,000 a year. Isn't that enough? And I said, yes, it's enough if you're bumping your full potential. But if you're capable of half a million dollars a year, you're somewhat of a loser. See, it's not the amount that counts. It's the extent of your reach that counts. That's what we want to do. Employ the full extent of our reach, whatever that amount turns out to be. If it's 5000 a year, wonderful. If, that, if you're really extending yourself economically, doing the best you can, and those numbers turn out to be 5000 wonderful. If it's 50000 wonderful. If it's a half a million, wonderful. As long as you're extending yourself, your mental, personal capacity to its limit, whatever those amounts are, those are the amounts. Because Mr. Schultz had this simple, simple philosophy. How far should you go? Answer, as far as you can. How much should you learn? As much as you can. How many books should you read? As many as you can. How much should you earn? As much as you can. How much should you share? As much as you can. What should you accomplish? As much as you can. That's a good philosophy. What could I do in comparison to what I am doing? What could I do to extend my reach? Am I fully employed? Good question. And I think that's the answer to some of the moral question. If you're properly using your eight hours and you're extending yourself and you're doing your best, whatever that amount is, that's, that's the amount. But financial independence is a worthwhile goal. If you can finally set money aside as being such a major object in trying to accomplish and paying the bills. And Mr. Shulv said to me, Mr. Owen, I think the only way to get money out of the way is to have plenty. So I went for that. Here's what also I found out. The time you've already set aside for labor is enough time to become wealthy. If you're working eight, ten hours a day, that's about it. You can't put in more than about eight or ten. But see, if you better utilize that eight or ten, and you double, triple, quadrupled your income, see, that would be okay. Just better utilization of the time you're already spending laboring, just a better use of it. Now, see, if you start throwing your health away by going for the money and working 20 hours a day, and slighting all your friends, and walking away from your family, see, now you've lost all the other values to go for one, and that would be, in my opinion, shortchanging yourself. But financial independence, let me give you just a few clues on financial independence, because part of it depends on the plan you have. It isn't necessarily how hard you work, or whatever else you sacrifice to go for it. You really don't have to do that. Most of us live long enough, and especially in this country of unique prosperity, we have chances enough to fairly quickly, before too long, solve the money problems of our life. One of the major reasons why most people don't is because they're operating on the wrong plan. And here's the key. It's not so much what you earn as what you do with what you earn. It's not so much what you earn as what you do with what you earn. I think according to the latest figures, the average person in this country now in a working lifetime makes half a million dollars. Average. In a working lifetime. The question is at the end of the working lifetime, where is it? Now see, some people have got it and some people haven't got it. Right? They both earned it, but they both didn't keep it. And part of it is just simply operating on the wrong plan. For financial independence, here's a good book to get, to start giving you some ideas. It's called The Richest Man in Babylon. The Richest Man in Babylon by Clayson, George Clayson. It's a good
good book to start with on financial independence. Neat little story. Give you some great ideas. Here's the theme of the book, The Richest Man in Babylon. Learn to live on 70% of your net income. This is just a suggestion plan. Learn to live on 70% of your net income. Now, net simply means after taxes, because that's the only money you get to see anyway, right? Jesus, master teacher, said, pay Caesar first. And in this country, Caesar takes it before we ever see it, right? So, <laughs> Caesar gets paid. But that, those were the instructions. Pay Caesar first. Okay? Give Caesar what belongs to Caesar. In uh, translating this into kids' language, we call it the care and feeding of the goose that lays the golden eggs. Everybody's got to be taught the care and feeding of the goose that lays the golden eggs. You don't tear up the goose and divide it up. No. Guys, I got me a handful of feathers. Say, oh no. Somebody else says, I got me a wing. Say, oh no, poor goose. Right? We won't have a goose very long. You must care and feed the goose that lays the golden eggs. And you say, well, the goose eats too much. Well, that may be true. Maybe we all pay a little too much in taxes, I'm sure. Right? The president is trying to get through the Congress some way to reduce our taxes so the goose won't eat too much. And I, every goose has an inclination to eat too much. Right? So the government spends too much money. The goose is overweight. I understand that. But we're all a little over. Right? Everything by longevity tends to get off course. Everything. Everything needs to be corrected. And that's just part of life. The longer something goes, the more tendency it is to eat a little too much, indulge a little too much, try to gather up a little too much power. You know, that's just natural. Right? And the government's the same way. Right? You hire somebody to be a servant in your house, and now they want to take over. You say, no, I hired you to take out the trash, not to run the house. But sure enough, by longevity, right? People just gather up, gather up, gather up. You know, more power and whatever. And then it's got to be corrected, put back in place, put back in place. Everything needs to be corrected. Our diets, our lives, our friendships, marriage, everything tends to... Get off course. Goes along pretty good and starts to drift. Got to bring it back, starts to drift. Bring it back, starts to drift. That's just part of life. So the goose does overeat. I understand that. And perhaps, you know, we do pay too many taxes. And the government does, you know, spend a, some of our money a bit recklessly. I understand that. But see, Jesus did say you've got to take care of Caesar. Because part of Caesar's responsibility is to be the goose that lays the golden eggs. We do have to have a society. We do have to have a government or you have no market. Okay. And among the governments of the world, we do have to protect ourselves. Because somebody's got to pay for the radar. And the Polaris submarines. And the B-52s. And the missiles. Somebody's got to pay. See, I don't mind picking up my share of the radar. You know, and hire somebody to watch it. And make sure they stay over there. You've got to do that. So you've got to care and feed the goose. Mr. Schoff taught me to be a happy taxpayer. Now that was a whole new thing for me. <laughs> be a happy taxpayer, not a reluctant taxpayer. Okay, you've got to care and feed the goose. And in this country, of course, you know, for a portion of our incomes, maybe it's a little too much, but pay it happily anyway. You know, maybe they'll straighten it out and it'll come down a little bit. Or whatever. Just pay it gladly. To know that we've got to have the Army and the Navy and the Air Force and the submarines and the battleships. We've got to have a show of strength. We've got to be a leader among the free world. We really do. And all that's got to be paid for. So I don't mind picking up my share. And everybody ought to pay their share. In my personal opinion, the poorest of the poor ought to pay federal income taxes. 
if it's only a dollar a year so they have the sense of contributing to the care and feeding of the goose instead of just taking they also contribute at least a dollar a year the poorest of the poor so that they have a sense of helping to pay for the safety and the security of the country because see with our present navy and army and air force and the governmental structure and what safety we do have around the world keeps us here secure in our homes right where we can work and enjoy each other's you know commerce possibilities trade goods and services and make money enjoy ourselves and have parties <laughs> now if somebody's willing to do all that out there while we're here having fun making money and having parties I don't mind picking up my share of the tab <laughs> okay so Caesar's first pay Caesar first then what you got left after Caesar needs to be divided up and the book the richest man in Babylon gives you some suggestions on how to divide up your money and where to put it so that you'll have a good plan everybody needs a financial plan because here's how you surely wind up broke spend all you make so you just wind up broke now in those early days way back there I spent more than I made that's why I'm making it down to budget finance to finance the deficit in my spending okay some suggestions on what to do with uh, with the money you've got left now after taxes one is learn to be enterprising profits are better than wages everybody should turn part of their income even if it's from wages into capital and become a capitalist the healthier the country becomes is going to be a result of more and more people becoming capitalists not just letting big, big business be the capitalist now communism teaches that all capital should be in the hands of the state and should we should take it out of the hands of the individuals because they're too dumb and stupid to know what to do with it all we want them to do is just show up and do their work and go home and behave themselves and stay out of trouble and we will take care of the capital the government now see in this country we don't believe that communism teaches everybody should blend into the mass to the glory of the state and we all say heck with that the state is the servant and all glory to the individual that's what we believe in capitalism take the capital and divide it up among all the people and let the people start a business and start this thing going with commerce and interchange of goods and services and you will create a dynamic society unprecedented in the history of the world and we've proven that that's true but see communism says give the state all the capital and we don't believe that we believe that everybody ought to be capitalists use it in their own way they'll think of things the state can't think of and they'll react much quicker than the state will right the state's always two three four years late government's always late and they always spend too much money right capital ought to be in the hands of the individuals now if you don't use capital and become a capitalist and you don't and you don't and you don't and everybody doesn't pretty soon guess what now the capital will all start going toward the state because the society has to survive okay now these are just some of my personal opinions but I'm entitled to those right I don't even claim they're right I just claim they're my opinions <laughs> that way I'm off the hook <laughs> but anyway be a capitalist make sure you've turned part of your income into capital and so you can teach kids how to be enterprising and capitalists from the time they're little just little kids you teach them how to have two bicycles one to ride and one to rent <laughs> to earn money okay and teach kids how to earn money not just get a job teach them how to be enterprising teach them how to sell one of the best ways to learn about life is just get out and sell something and little kids can sell teach them how to buy a bottle of soap for two dollars and sell it for three right down the street your markets next door you don't have to go very far teach kids how to knock on doors say miss brown I got this soap it's the finest in the world teach them how to do that and then teach them all the advantages of being a kid some people will buy from you just because you're little they will it's an advantage and the littler the better so you teach them how to be little 
And you've got to hurry because you won't be little forever, right? Get out there and take advantage. Right? So a little kid knocks on the door and says, Miss Brown, I've got this soap. It only costs $3 and it's the best there is. And I'm your neighbor. I can take care of you. You should buy it. And besides, I'm little. <laughs> Miss Brown says, hey, I appreciate you coming by. That's really nice. I appreciate that. But look, I've already got plenty of soap. Little kid says, well, let me come in and check. <laughs> See, kids don't mind doing that, right? I mean, they know how to overcome objections. You don't need to give them classes. They're incredible. Now, a little kid makes a sale. has got $3. Now, what you've got to do is not only teach him how to earn the $3, how to get the $3 by making a sale. Now, you've got to teach him what to do with the money. Now, it's very simple what to do with $2, right? Set it aside so you can buy another bottle of soap. Kid says, well, that makes sense. Otherwise, you'd be out of business. That's right. And I know some adults are a little short on that information. <laughs> so you've got to set aside $2. Kid says, well, okay, then i got a dollar to spend. Say, no, no, if you spend that, you'll wind up like most people, age 65 broke. And then take them to that part of town where people are 65 and broke. And show them. Let them walk around the neighborhood. Drive around. And the kid says, well, I don't want to live like this. Say, fine, now here's what you do with your money. You just got to show. Sometimes you got to go and touch and look and see what you don't want so that you'll make arrangements over here not to ever be there. What was that little movie, that movie they came out with where they took the kids to the jails? Scared straight. Let them visit with the prisoners, right? And firsthand they looked around saw these bars in the jail, prisons, talked to some of the prisoners, and firsthand got somebody to say, whatever you do, don't come here. Now, that's not some minister saying, don't go there. That's the man saying, don't come here, whatever you do. Let me show you what it's like. Here's where I have to sleep. I can't get out. I've got 15 more years to spend here. Kids' eyes get about this big saying... I don't ever want to wind up here. See, that's good, right? And to teach us all, we've just got to go where it is, where people have had the wrong plan. And that's sad, right? To look back and say, I picked up the wrong plan at age 20. Look where I am. Who talked me into this plan? I bought the wrong plan. So then the kid says, okay, what will I do with my dollar? Say, here's what you do with your dollar. Ten cents is for the increase of capital. And everybody ought to have the same plan. Ten cents out of every dollar should be for the increase of capital. Now, see, the kid understands this right away. He says, well, that's true. If you saved up your dimes and could buy two bottles of soap instead of one, you save yourself a trip. That's right. Now, not only do you save yourself a trip, some people will sell you two bottles cheaper than one. You buy one bottle for two dollars. They sell you two bottles for three eighty. Kid says, how clever. Then when you sell it, you make more money. That's right. That's why you've got to accumulate your capital, because everybody benefits from it. They get to sell two bottles instead of one at a time, so it's better for them, and it's better for you, and it's better for everybody. Now you're starting to teach commerce, capitalism, how to earn money, how to be responsible, and mainly what to do with it. Here's another 10 cents. Another 10 cents is to give charity. I really should have put that first. Right after Caesar, Jesus said, pay Caesar first, then pay God. Charity. Some churches teach 10%. That's good. Like, give it to the church and let the church distribute it however. Or distribute it yourself, you know, whatever. But make sure you put back part of what you take out. Charity. Some people are less fortunate. Some people, you know, live tragic lives and they need our help. So, 10% set aside to help those that are unfortunate cannot help themselves. Ten cents for giving. And a good time to learn ten cents for giving is when you're little. Because, see, it's pretty easy to flip a dime out of a dollar. What's a little more difficult is to give a hundred thousand out of a million. 
<laughs> Seems as though if I had a million, I'd give a hundred thousand. I'm not that sure. <laughs> That's a lot of money. We better learn it now, just in case, you know, you get the big stuff and won't turn loose of it. So develop the habit now of the ten cents, right? Kids should learn the first dollar you get, you should learn how to divide it up. Because if you let a kid, when he gets his first dollar, spend it all, you've already started them on the wrong habit pattern. Now, what if they do that the rest of their life? They will be in serious trouble. So you've got to teach them what to do with the first dollar, the first dollar, or as quickly as possible, correct what might be wrong. So 10 cents for charity, 10 cents for the increase of capital, and 10 more cents is for investing. Now, at first, use that 10 cents, thinking uh, the richest man in Babylon says, use 10 cents to pay off all your bills, which is good. Now you can start using it for investing, but pay off all your bills first, all the little accumulation of credit cards and all that stuff. There's a Bible phrase that says, the borrower is servant to the lender. And as quickly as possible, you don't want to be a servant anymore. What you want to be is a lender, not a borrower. Get on the other side of the table as soon as you can. The borrower is servant to the lender. Now, once you've got all those little bills paid off, just cleaned up all the little bills, Arnold's linoleum, everything, all that stuff, just clean all that up. Now you've got some money to invest. Now here's where you should invest some of your money, in financial institutions, so that it provides a larger capital pool for successful people to borrow and start big businesses that you at first can't start, build big factories and employ lots of people. There needs to be an, a collection of capital so that people can borrow it. And guess what they will do when they borrow your money? Pay you for the use of it. So you teach kids how to put their money in savings accounts, financial institutions. In Australia not long ago, a man said to me, I'm recommending everybody put their money in gold, take it out of all the banks. I said, then you'll bankrupt the country. You can't do something and teach it to everybody else that's going to bankrupt the country. You can't be totally self-protective. You must care and feed the goose that lays the golden eggs. If you're going to drive on the society streets and if you're going to drive on and walk on society's sidewalk and indulge in society's commerce and goods and services in the community, you've got to do your share to care and feed the goose. You can't grab yours and put it in gold and hide it and put it in the ground because if everybody did that, we would have no society. So you can't teach something that if everybody did would wreck the whole thing. He said, well, I never thought about that. I said, that's obvious. <laughs> Right now, you must, you must think, you must ponder. What's going to help all of society? Somebody says, "Well, I'm going to grab everything I got, barricade myself, go off to a cave in the mountains, and wait with a gun." Well, if everybody did that, right, then the world would be over, and God would have to start all over again, which He's done on occasion. <laughs> But most people didn't enjoy the process. <laughs> so what's going to help everybody? What's going to help commerce? What, what, what can I do on my part on taxes and my part on savings and my part on helping financial institutions that will build businesses and employ more people and keep the health of the country going and alive? Right? You just have to think, not just about yourself. Right? Self-thinking is for the development of skill. Now we need to think also outward about what can I do, my part, my ten cents, my percentage. And you can teach this to kids. Put your money in financial institutions. Kid says, well, do you get it back? They say, sure you get it back. They borrow it for a while and give it back to you. And they also pay you interest on it, pay you money for using it. Kid says, how clever. And then you give them the blockbuster. He says, yeah, but what do they pay kids? And you give them the good news. Same rate as they pay adults. Now you can start acting big. Because now, number one, you are a lender instead of a borrower. And you're getting paid as much as adults. Even if you're 10, they pay you the same percentage. 
kids as well. Now then, you also have to teach kids how to be happy taxpayers. Because kids become taxpayers as soon as they spend money. They go down to the local store, spend 50 cents. Shopkeeper wants what else? Three more cents. Kid says, it says 50 cents here. Says, it's 53 cents. You've got to give me three more cents. Kid says, well, what's that for? Who gets that money? Now at age 10, he's a taxpayer. Three cents he's got to cough up. Out of his hard-earned money. He earned it. It's his. Kid says, uh, the shopkeeper says, you've got to give me three cents. It's taxes. Little kid says, well, I'm only 10. Doesn't matter. At 10, you become a taxpayer. Now you've got to teach kids how to be happy taxpayers and what the three cents is for. Otherwise, they will be confused. So you teach them what the three cents is for. See, so well, see the sidewalks and the streets? Everybody can't make their portion of the street. You don't have the equipment. So what we do is we all gather up this money from all of us and we pay somebody to build these streets and these sidewalks. So you have something to ride your bicycle on? And you can go places. Kid says, well, that makes sense. Then here's my three cents. I'll make my contribution. It's part of the care and feeding of the goose that lays the golden eggs. And then you also teach kids. See, see the police car going there? You own that. <laughs> it's yours. And the guy in it's one of your servants. <laughs> servant. Called public what? Servant. servant. So at age 10, you got some servants. <laughs> servants. Taking care. Keeping the bullies away. When you get in trouble, give a call. See, once kids understand, once people understand where the money goes, what's it for, make the happy contribution, divide up your money gladly instead of reluctantly, okay, then you can just change a lot of this inner turmoil. And you get more excited about participating and doing your part and learning skills and growing so that you become an incredibly unique part of society rather than a reluctant part and a foot-dragging part and an unhappy part and a miserable part. And you do it with animosity instead of joy. So you can imagine what the complex of society and how it would change if everybody had those feelings. But if enough of us do, see, we'll be able to affect all the others, at least in some measure. What you do with your money. So now we've got 30% set aside. Learn to live on 70. Okay? Caesar first. Then God. 10 cents for increase of capital. 10 cents to invest. Live on 70. Now once you get doing extremely well, you can even start living on less and less and less. Because the amount is more and more and more. Now, a few more tips on financial independence and we'll take our first break. Here they are. Number one, if you haven't done it in a long time, put together a financial statement on yourself. A financial statement simply is a piece of paper divided in half and on one side is all the list of your assets, the value of your assets. On the other side of the paper is all that you owe called liabilities. Then you subtract one from the other and that now is called your net worth. Mr. Schoff asked me, have you put together a financial statement recently? I said, I never have put together one. He says, well, now's the time to do it. And I wasn't too happy about putting together that first one. I says, well, it's not going to look that good. He said, it doesn't matter how it looks. You've got to have one. To get where you want to go, first of all, you've got to know where you are. Say, where am I without kidding anybody? Okay, now this first financial statement, you don't have to publish it in a public record. It's for your own private eyes to see, but you've got to see where you are. Take a look. Now, when I put my first one together, I had no problem on the liability side. I mean, that was long list. Budget finance, all they were all on there. Money I'd borrowed from my parents. I mean, it was all on there, right? On the asset side, though, I really started scraping the bottom of the barrel. I put the value of my shoes on there. I put shoes. <laughs> there was ten bucks at least, right? I mean, I'm scraping. So I won't look so bad, right? But anyway, so if you putting together your first one, right, you know, whatever you got to do, make it look as good as you can. But also, make sure it's accurate and make sure you take a good look at where you are. 
Now then, play this financial independence program like a game. Be delighted in reducing your liabilities and increasing your assets. Once I got the hang of this, I started putting together a financial statement about every 30 days, sometimes even less. If I knew the picture had changed quite a bit, I'd draw me up a new financial statement so I could put away the old one. Here's my new one. You just play it like a game. And then learn to be excited about reducing your liabilities. Shope taught me how to pay my bills with enthusiasm. Now, see, that was a whole new thing for me. He said, the next time you pay $100 on an account, put a little note in there and say, with great excitement, I send you this $100. <laughs> he says, you won't believe what it'll do on the other end, right? <laughs> when they get that note. But he says, most important of all, you won't believe what it'll do on your end. Now starting to part with your money with, with, with excitement, with enthusiasm. He started changing my whole opinion about money and about paying my bills and about capital and learning to live with, within restricted limits. He got me excited about it. And see, a big part of what you do with your plan is going to be your attitude about it. So develop a whole new attitude about your money. Remember, it's not the amounts that count. It's the attitude and the plan. He got me to open up my first savings account. And he said, go down there with excitement and open it up. I've never had a savings account. So I told him, I said, well, I don't have any money to open up a savings account. He said, have you got $10? I said, well, yeah, I got $10. He said, then go get it open. It's not the amount. It's the plan. So I marched down to the bank and opened up my first savings account. Now that took a little bit. I'm a grown man. And I said to the lady... They waited on me there at the bank. I said, I want to open up a savings account. She said, fine. What's your name? I said, Mr. Roan. She said, Mr. Roan, just fill this out. I said, okay. So I filled it out. I said, uh, there it is. She looked it over and she said, that's fine. She said, uh, how are we going to get this started? I said, uh, put 10 in. She said, 10 what? I said, $10. <laughs> $10. <laughs> Now, Shove said, be enthusiastic. Now, see, I had trouble there. <laughs> I'm 25, I'm married, my family's starting, I'm working and I've been to college, and I'm opening up my first savings account with only $10. Now, that was tough. But Shove said, swallow hard and just go do it. Do it with excitement, because it'll change. It's the plan that counts, and not the amount. Wow. So I put the $10 in. I said, hey, this doesn't look like much, but I said, I'll tell you what, before long, I will have the largest savings account in this bank. She said, well, if you say so. <laughs> <laughs> Guess what? Within less than two years, I had the largest savings account in that bank in less than two years. Shof was right. It wasn't the amount. It was the attitude. It was my new plan. I got excited about rearranging my life, putting it together. Here's a couple more. Keep strict accounts. Have you ever heard the old expression, I don't know where it all goes? Let me give you probably one of the most important phrases of the whole weekend. You've got to know where it all goes. you just got to know. The Rockefeller boys said their father, grandfather, made them keep track of every penny they got and where it went. It's called habit. You just got to know where it's going, what's happening. Get a handle on it. It's part of how you become financially independent. Because I found out, even early in the game when I was making some pretty good money, I found out you could make $5,000 a month and go broke. Somebody says, how could you go broke making 5000 a month? It's easy. Spend 6000 <laughs> And nine months from Thursday, it's over. Right? If your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep becomes your downfall. You've got to know where it goes. 
So keep strict accounts. Now then, when you can start investing, start a little business on the side, do a little buying and selling. See, some of the people just got incredibly wealthy in this part of the country, right? In real estate in the last 12, 15 years. Unbelievable. Be on the lookout for buying. Now, collectively, for us, you know, in, in doing business, we have somebody who specializes in looking for investments. But until you can afford that kind of luxury where people can look and find places, you know, to put your money to get best advantage of making it useful as well as making money, you've just got to be sharp enough on your own to do some buying, do some selling. Now, so you can even teach kids how to make proper investments. What if kids bought light bulbs three years ago and just put them aside, put them away, went down to the Safeway and bought them and brought them home, put them under the bed, put them in the closet three years ago? What are they worth today? Two or three times as much as they were three years ago. How would you like to make that kind of return on your money? Incredible. Kid says, light bulbs, I never thought about that. Just buy some and set them aside. Buy one, buy ten, buy a dozen, buy a hundred. Save up your money, put them in light bulbs, set them aside. Okay, three years later, now you've got some light bulbs to sell at an incredibly inflated price. Kid says, well, yeah, where do you sell light bulbs? Same people that are buying your soap, just right down the street. <laughs> <laughs> Financial independence. Put your plan together and get your family excited about it. Get the kids excited about it, husband excited, get the wife excited. This is something that if everybody works on, if everybody has a financial statement, if everybody's knowing where it's going, and everybody has a celebration every once in a while when the assets are going up and the liabilities are coming down and the net worth is changing, make it a source of celebration, right? We're among an incredible group in comparing financial statements. I think the, the major guy in our group is worth about 50 million. So, you know, he, informed, he becomes an, an incredible incentive for the rest of us. It's nice to have somebody around, right, that's carrying that kind of heavy, right? It gives you something to shoot for. You're looking, say, yeah, I'm looking pretty good. And then you see somebody else's financial statement. You say, well, I got a little ways to go. But anyway, play it like a game. Get excited about it. Develop the skills and how to earn money. Thinking of enterprises, investments, developing more skills so you can earn more money. But then have an incredibly excellent plan on what to do with your money. And sure enough, very quickly, the first year, the second year, the third year, you can't believe the changes that will start to be made. And the, the major change, of course, is in your own self-confidence. And that's where riches come from, self-confidence. It's not the growing bank account. It's your growing awareness that you're in charge. You've got a plan. You're on track. It's changing because you changed it. It's different because you made it different. It's growing because you made certain commitments to yourself. And those kind of feelings are where the treasure is. Because the true treasure is in personal development. Happiness is not contained in what you get. Happiness is contained in what you become. But sure enough, what you become is related to what you get. So you can take a look at what you've gotten and have great satisfaction that you're the one that designed it. You're the one that defined it. You just didn't let it drift and drift and get into trouble. You made the changes. You made the hard decisions. So for your own financial independence, Get the book, get some other books, do some reading, make it a game, play it, have a plan, change your attitude, become a happy taxpayer, pay your bills with enthusiasm, put all this together and I'll tell you what, it'll start to change, you won't believe. Okay, financial independence. To receive more information on Jim Rohn's speaking schedule and products, please visit his website at www.jimrohn.com, where you can also subscribe to receive free the weekly Jim Rohn EZ newsletter. Or you can call Jim's office at 800 929 0434. In the Dallas Fort Worth area, please call 817 442 5407. All mail should be directed to Jim Rohn International. 2835 Exchange Boulevard, Suite 200, South Lake, Texas, 76092. Thanks again for listening, and make it your best year ever. Here's to your success.